if you run X11 like most people on Linux, your home directory is going to be littered with all of these configuration and startup files without any real clear indication on what some of them are supposed to be used for. Now, I'm going to try to clear up some of this confusion, especially with the biggest confusion that exists, which is with the XNRC, X Session, and X Profile, because when you look at these and then look at the syntax for how you actually write them, they look like they're basically identical files. So we're going to start with those three first. Okay, so the reason why all of these look basically the same is because you're going to be using them to do pretty much the exact same thing. It's just that you're going to be using them in slightly different ways. So what you're going to be using them for is for initializing what needs to be initialized to actually run your graphical environment. Whether you're using a window manager or a desktop environment doesn't actually matter. All three of these files can actually be used. So on my system, I am running just an XNRC because on my system, I don't actually use a display manager. So that's sort of the big differentiating point between all of these files. So the XNRC is going to be used by an application called XNIT or Start X, and that is how I actually start up my X server directly from the TTY without actually needing to have a pretty login screen. So let's actually have a look at that file. It looks a little something like this. So I'm starting up all of these applications here. Technically, these don't actually need to be here because all of these can run without my graphical environment actually running, and I could use them from the TTY. The the reason why I start them here though is because I never actually run my system from the TTY so it just makes more sense to me to just launch everything here instead. Then the other ones I have here are basically things that rely on my X server running or things where it just wouldn't really make sense to run without an X server. And then the last line of my XNetRC is going to be an exec line and that actually starts at my graphical environment. So in my case, that's going to be awesome. But if I was running something like BSPWM, it would say BSPWM here. If I was running i3, it would say i3. If I was running GNOME, I don't think you run GNOME directly. I think there's a separate application you have to call I'd always recommend checking the documentation on how to actually start up your graphical environment because it's not always just the name of the package. So once this last line runs, this is going to become your root X11 window. So then every other window you open up after that is going to be opened up inside of that window. Technically, you don't actually need to start up something like a window manager or a graphical environment. You can run stuff directly on the X server itself. It's just that it's going to be much harder to actually open up multiple windows at once. Now, things you can't launch in here are things that are dependent on this last application actually running. So, for example, if I had something like BSPWM running in here and I had a script that relies on BSPWM. I couldn't actually run that in here because I could only run it before the application actually starts. Now, because you are going to run this with StartX, you technically don't need it in your home directory because StartX can actually take a file argument. It's just that the file in your home directory is going to be the default location to actually check. So in my case, what I'm doing is I'm running this command right here. So StartX and then passing in the new location of the file. If you ever want an example of how your X and RC should be structured, you can always go to slash Etsy slash X11 slash X init slash X and RC. Obviously, this assumes that you have X and it actually installed, and this shows you how it should actually be structured. Now, in my case, I'm not actually doing the same sort of checks that are being done in here, mainly because I'm lazy and sort of wrote this before I knew about this, but I'd recommend actually using this template if you have no idea what you're doing. Now, what about X Session? So X Session is a little bit of a weird one. So the way you write it is literally line by line identical to the XNRC, but the X Session is going to be used by a display manager. But Typically, you're not actually going to use it with most modern display managers. So what they were actually used for is prior to display managers having an easy way to actually determine what graphical environments you actually have installed, they would look for your X session files. And then judging by the X session files, those would be the graphical environments you could actually log into. So if you wanted to say launch up specific applications for GNOME and for BSPWM and for whatever other graphical environments you have, that is what you would use an X session for. But nowadays, selecting the graphical environment is typically done automatically, so the X session files see much less usage. 
In some cases, though, you can set sort of like a custom graphical environment to launch. And in that case, it's going to use an X session file. Now, the last one we have is the X profile. Now, I've never actually used an X profile on my system because X profiles are basically exclusively used by a display manager, which I still think is a horrible name, but display manager is basically the login screen you see at the start of your system if you actually use one. So the one difference between the XNetRC and the X profile is the X profile doesn't have that last exec line where we actually start up our graphical environment because the graphical environment is going to be started up by the display manager itself. So the rest of the X profile starting up various applications, initializing files, things like this, all will still be done in the file, but starting up the graphical environment isn't going to be done by that. Now, this isn't always a hard and fast rule. So things like, say, LightDM do actually use an X profile, but then other display managers decide they want to use an X session, or they want to maybe even use an X and RC. So even though these are general rules that do exist, some application developers decide they want to do their own thing. Another one you'll see in your home directory and probably have no idea what it's doing there is your .x authority file. Now, this is a file that you will never actually go and write by hand. This is just being used by the X server itself. So what it does is stores your login credentials to the X server in the form of a cookie. This is basically just used to authenticate your connection to the display. Now, if you ever have login issues where your X server basically just soft locks, it's very likely that you don't actually have write permission for the X authority file. And when you don't have write permission, basically your X server doesn't really know what to do with the credentials and pretty much just freezes. Now you can just go and skip past that by spamming control C a couple of times, but you're much better off just fixing the problem. Now, while you could go and fix the file with the chmod command, Honestly, it's much easier just to go and delete the X authority file, restart your X server, and let X11 just regenerate the X authority file with the correct permissions. Because even if you do go and fix it with Chamod, it won't actually store your credentials inside of the file until the next time you launch anyway. So it's just easier to do the launch when you're actually resetting it. If you are ever unsure if your credentials are being stored, what you can do is run X auth list, and that will list out all of the cookies being stored inside of the file. In my case, I'm the only user logged onto the system and I'm the only cookie inside of the file. Typically, you'll only see problems with this file if you go and hard shut down your system while X11 is doing something really important. So whether that be, you know, starting up or shutting down, just make sure your system is fully powered on during that sequence. If you do happen to lose your power though, it is very easy to fix. Besides your system never properly starting up the X server, you'll also see some extra files appear inside of your home directory as well. So these will be things like the .xauthority-c, dash L or dash N. These files are completely normal for the operation of X11, but they are supposed to be temporary files. So they're basically just lock files and extra files to store information before it's being stored inside of the X authority file. So if these files do stick around, that is a very clear sign that you do have a problem you need to address with your X authority file. If you do have to go and fix the permissions for your X authority file, it's best to delete these files as well, just to make sure that X11 doesn't have any issues generating its own files. Setting things like your terminal color scheme, your screen DPI, font anti-aliasing, font hinting, and a bunch of other general settings that are going to be used by a lot of the X11 applications on your system. But as we saw with the URXVT settings here, sometimes it doesn't actually have to be general, sometimes it can be for very specific applications. Applications. Usually when it is for a specific application though, it's going to be something fairly minimal and something fairly low level. So things like say X cursor, X screensaver, X clock, X PDF, various applications like that. While this could have been a really, really powerful file and basically just a one-stop shop for all of the different color settings and things like that for all the applications on your system, in reality, it doesn't actually get used like that. So most terminals have their own terminal configuration file. URXVT and I think maybe Xterm are the only ones that actually use this file very heavily. Things like Alacrity and Kitty have their own own completely different syntax to go and work with and basically don't acknowledge the existence of this file. And that's just for terminals. When you move outside of the terminal world, 
Finding applications that actually support your X resources are very, very few and far between. There are a couple out there, but don't expect it to be very common. One of the really nice things about the X resources file for terminals that do actually support it is this is how you use things like, say, Pywall and have the color scheme just change very easily like that. Basically, all Pywall does is just modifies the contents of this file. One of the lines you may have spotted in my XNRC file was actually sourcing this file. So if we go back over to that one, and down to this one, if we run xrdb-load, then we can actually pass in the X resources file we want to use. So in my case, it's located in my config directory, but normally it will be located inside of your home. There is one more file I want to mention, and even though this one isn't going to be used by everyone, I still think it's worth the mention, and that is the xmodmap file. This one doesn't actually have to be called xmodmap, it's sort of just convention because the application that uses it is also called xmodmap. You would go and generate the file by running this command right here, so xmodmap-pke, this generates a full list of all of the key bindings for your keyboard, and then you can actually go and modify each of these lines in here to remap keys to do different things. So for example, if you want to go and swap out your caps lock with escape, just so escape is a little bit easier to hit if you're using something like vim, that is one use case I've used in the past. If you want to know the specific names for the keys you can use in this file, because it's not always entirely obvious. For example, if you want to have an at symbol, it's not actually the symbol at, it's the word at. You can go find a list of these online in places like the Arch Linux Wiki, or by using applications like XCV. I've done a full dedicated video just on XModMap, and there's way too much about it to cover today, so I'd recommend going and checking out that video. But for now, if you want to use the file, all you need to do is go run the XModMap program, and then pass in the path to the file. One thing to note about XModMap, though, is it will be overridden by more modern ways of rebinding keys, so things like, say, set XKB map or the system built into things like, say, GNOME. There are countless other X-related files on your system, but these are the ones you'll typically see just in your home directory. If you're going to those ones in, say, your Etsy directory, I would presume you actually know what the file is supposed to do. But if you're new to Linux, and you just suddenly saw all of these new files in your home directory, I could understand why you'd be a bit confused about them. As always, I'm going to shill my channel, so if you are enjoying the content, and you're not subscribed yet, doing so would be really really helpful so I think that's gonna be basically everything for me but before I go I would like to thank my supporters so a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andrew, Nathan, David, Monza, Will, Brennan, Chico, Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Mitchell, uh, Peter D, Stephen, Tony, Tushar and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support my work, the links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, start, leave, pay, all of that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over T, available basically anywhere and then this channel is available on Odyssey, Library and BitChute if you want to watch my content on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me and I'm out.